Okay, uh, leave your Bibles there in Ephesians chapter 3. Look at verse number 2. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 2. It says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. And I'll just stop there. That's the title for the sermon tonight. The dispensation or dispensation of the grace of God. Now, I don't know what that means to you, brethren. What does that mean to you as you read that? Dispensation of the grace of God. Actually, it's not that complicated. There are some people that really want to make this really complicated. And I hope as we go through this chapter today with you, that uh, it'll be made clear for you. Ephesians chapter 3 there. And it's just continuing the same thoughts that we left off in chapters number 2 and chapter number 1. Let's, so let's start off with verse number 1, the Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1, it says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. I, lo- I, love, I love verse number 1 immediately. Now, if you don't know, Paul right now, he, he literally is a prisoner. He is literally in Rome as a prisoner behind bars, and he writes this letter. This is one of many, many epistles that he writes while he's in prison. And you would think, how would you feel, brethren, if you're in prison? How would you feel if you're behind bars, you're arrested, and you don't have your freedom? Obviously, you'd be cast down. Obviously, you'd be upset. You know, what if you're in prison for the cause of Christ, though? You know, what if you... It'd still be difficult. You're away from your family, away from your friends, away from the people that you know... But I love the positive attitude that Paul has. He says, look, he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. In other words, he says, look, I'm in prison. You know, he goes like, you know, I I would love to be free. I would love to be out there visiting churches. I'd I'd love to be out there preaching the gospel. I'd, I'd love to be out there visiting and preaching all these churches and encouraging the brethren. But he says, look, I'm in prison for you. Because what opportunity did he have then to be in prison? The opportunity presented himself where he couldn't move, where he was stuck in that place. He had nothing else to do but to write an epistle to the Ephesian church. And of course, this is scripture. This is given by inspiration of God uh, for the Ephesian church to grow and for us to grow. So praise God that Paul was a prisoner for Jesus Christ. Because by this process, we were able to have these other epistles for us that became the canon of scripture and so I love his positive attitude and brethren that the heart the, the thing that I, I want to challenge you with tonight or this evening is that when you go through difficulties now you may never be thrown in prison but when you go through hardships when you go through sicknesses when you're broke when you're having conflicts with your family and your you know your friends when things aren't going well for you I hope you stop and consider and, and, and ask well God I'm in a tough place But how can I remain positive? How can I remain having a positive outlook to life? You know, it's no secret, brethren, that if you're somebody that struggles to make friends, if you're someone that struggles to get along with people, think about your attitude. Think about the kind of character you are. You know, there are a lot of people that can't make friends simply because they're always negative. Always negative. You know, something happens, I've got to talk about how bad this situation is. You know, oh, this person, instead of, instead of edifying brethren in the church, instead of saying, praise God for brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. No, they'll look at the negative. Look at brother, why isn't brother so-and-so in church today? Why isn't sister so-and-so, you know, uh, uh, have a smile on her face today? And you know, a lot of people have a very negative or a very critical attitude to life. Oh, the pastor didn't preach a great sermon this week. Instead of what was that one point that you may have taken out of the sermon to help you grow in life. And you know, if you're always a negative person, people aren't going to want to be your friends. I mean, if you're just constantly negative about everything. I'm not saying there's never a time to be negative. I'm not saying there's never a time to be sorrowful and to be cast down. But you've got to invest in other people as well. You know, Paul looks at his situation. I'm in prison, but praise God for you Gentiles. I get to be here and be a blessing towards you by writing this epistle to you. That's a positive attitude. Right? He doesn't whinge and complain about his prison, how he doesn't have the best food, how he doesn't have his freedom. He just praises God for the situation that he finds himself in. You know, God will use uh, negative uh, circumstances in your life to work in your life. And you've got to have a positive attitude. You've got to turn around and say, well, God, you must have put me in this situation for a reason. What is that reason? How can I be a blessing to others while I find myself in a very tough situation? Um, if, I'm just going to read to you, uh, you guys say that I'm going to read to you from Romans chapter 5 verse 1. 
It says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Praise God that we can rejoice in His grace. We can rejoice in His glory. But then it says this, and not only so. So not just when things are going well. He turns the corner here in verse number three. He says, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Hey, Paul was going through tribulation here. Arrested, right? But he says, when, when God allows us to go through trials and tribulation, it's going to work patience. You know what I see in Paul? He's someone that is patient. He's in tribulation, but he's patient about it. Well, I'm here. I'm going to write this epistle to the brethren there in, in Ephesus. And then it says here, uh, verse number four, and patience, experience, and experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Brethren, when you're going through tribulations, ask God once again, how can you work patience in my life, Lord? Are you helping me to be more patient? And then with the patience comes experience, right? And, and you know, going through experience is what helps you grow. You know, being, being a model employee, being someone that works hard and knows their job well, that comes with experience. You know, being knowledgeable in your Bible comes with experience of reading your Bible. Okay, if you don't read your Bible, you're never going to be an experienced person in the, in the Word of God. You know, if you want to be an experienced soul winner, you need to get out there and go soul winning. You can't say, well, I won't go till I, until I'm experienced. Well, you're never going to be experienced. You've got to get out there and gain the experience. And then when it comes to experience, hope. Hope's the next thing. Once you gain experience, you gain hope. And that's the, that's the attitude we need to have. A hopeful attitude. No matter what situation we find ourselves in, find hope, find a positive uh, view from, from where you're at. And it says, and hope maketh not ashamed. Brethren, how much, how much boldness do you have in the faith? How confident are you in the faith? Or would you say to me, Pastor Kevin, actually, I'm quite ashamed. You know, when I have the opportunity to speak to someone about the gospel, I actually, I, I don't open my mouth. I'm ashamed. Or if someone challenges me with what the Word of God says, which is contrary to this world's philosophy, are you ashamed to tell people what the Bible says? I hope not. Okay, I hope that's not you. If you can learn to gain hope, you allow God to use the negative experiences in your life, you're going to come out as someone with great power, great boldness, and great strength. And this is kind of the theme here of Ephesians chapter 3. Look at verse number 2. Ephesians number 3 verse 2. And ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, Word. Pastor Kevin, do you believe in the dispensation of the grace of God? 100%. We just read about it there in verse number 3. Okay. What is the dispensation, though, of the grace of God? What is it there? Well, you know what some will tell you? Have, let me see a show of hands. Who's heard of the dispensation of grace as a, as a theology in church? Who's heard, maybe you've not heard of that, who's heard of the church age? Okay, well, basically it's the same thing. Okay, it's the same thing by different terms. It's the same idea. And I've talked about dispensationalism when I was preaching through Ephesians chapter 1. Well, here we have the word dispensation again. And look, I've done Bible college, not Bible college, but I've done Bible college courses. Okay, uh, and some of these courses, and one of them for is called hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is just a fancy Greek word of saying uh, interpretation. Okay, I've done a course of Bible interpretation, which had a lot of great things in it. Don't get me wrong, a lot of good things that I learned in it. But I was taught dispensationalism. Say, what is dispensationalism? Well, dispensationalism teaches, generally, there are different views of this, generally teach that there are seven dispensations or seven ages that God works in. Okay? And those seven dispensations or those seven ages are the age of innocence, the age of conscience, the age of human government, the age of promise, the age of law. The law has to do with the Old Testament. Then the age of grace or the church age, which apparently we're supposed to be in now. And then the age of the millennium or the, or the, yeah, the millennial age, whatever. Seven ages. And I say these are different dispensations. 
Now, you probably wonder, what are dispensations? What are oh, well, and that's what they say. Seven dispensations, seven periods of time which God would work with mankind. And then man would fail in one dispensation, and God would say, well, you failed, I've got to give you a new dispensation. And then man will fail in that dispensation. Well, you failed again. You know, I had to flood the earth, for example. Now we've got to try another dispensation. Well, you failed again. Now we've got to try another dispensation. This is, honestly, this is what they believe. But think about this for a moment. Now, I don't, I don't believe in this, okay? But then when you get to the dispensation of the church, or the dispensation of, of, the, of the grace of God, you know, this is the time when Christ has come and died on the cross. How in the world would this dispensation fail? How in the world? If, that's, if it's true, if what they're saying is true, okay, listen, Christ became sin for us on the cross. Christ died for our sins. Not just died for our sins, but he took on our sins in his own body. And he rose again from the dead, okay? And he's imputed his own righteousness upon us. So when we stand before God the Father, we're perfect. We're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What a great promise. If we're in the righteousness of Christ in this age, church age, church age, okay? If we're in that, how do we fail? We're in Christ. Think about that. If you're saying, well, we're going to fail this age until God has to bring in another age afterwards, well, then Christ failed. Because we're, we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. It's, su it's such a false teaching, brethren, and it's not that com complicated. If that went over your head a little bit as I was going through those seven dispensations, don't panic. You're not missing out on anything important, okay? I'll tell you what this is about. And like many things, I, I just wish I could teach you through Ephesians chapter 3, but you've got to debunk these false teachings so we can fully appreciate what this, what this is teaching, right? Now, it's not difficult. Look at verse number 2 again. It says, if ye have heard, now notice the next words, of the dispensation of the grace of God, okay? Dispensation of the grace of God. Now, very quickly, I mentioned this as an example before, but maybe in your workplace, maybe even in your home, you've got a, <coughs> a, a, a water dispenser. Some people call it a water cooler. You know what I'm talking about. You go there, you go to one of those machines, you put your cup in there and it, and it, it, dis it dispenses water for you. I just drank from a dispensation of water, okay? You know, that machine dispensed it, and there I had it, right? In other words, the machine, the, the water dispenser, or the, like, the, like a vending machine, okay? It dispenses, you know, it dispenses Pepsi, it dispenses Coca-Cola, it dispenses, what do you guys like eating, burger ring? Look, all that's bad for you, by the way, but anyway, it dispenses all this junk. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a machine that, that gives something, right? It, it gives something. And that's all dispensation means. It is given of the grace of God. Now look, the good thing about the Bible, it defines itself. You know, you don't have to take my word for it. Drop down to verse number 7. Drop down to verse number 7. Look at this. Whereof I was made a minister according to... Now let's focus on the next words. According to the gift of the grace of of God given unto me. Uh, compare that to verse number two. Of the dispensation of the grace of God. Verse number seven. According to the gift of the grace of God. It's already defined for us. What's the dispensation here? The gift. Okay, the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. When the water dispenser gives me, a dis you know, dispenses water for me, it's given me water. Okay, and when, when, when Paul says here that, he's, that you know, when you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, what he says is God has given me the gospel. God has given me his word, and I'm going to now dispense that. Not only has God given, dispense that to me, now I'm going to give that to you. You know, when I come here and I preach for you, when I open the Bible, God has dispensed his grace and his words for us right here. And I receive that, and I come, and I give that to you, Word. That's preaching. That's, what, that's all that's going on, guys, right? And I come here, and I give that to you. And Paul is saying, look, I'm just taking of the grace of God, and I'm, gonna, I'm giving it back to you, Ephesians. Is that complicated? That's what it says. That's what he means, brethren. It's it dispense, uh, dispensing of something is giving of something. And God has given us His grace. Now, let's keep going. Uh, let's drop, drop down to verse number 21. Actually, before we read verse 21, because they say, uh, those that teach dispensational theology, they say, well, we're living right now in the dispensation of the church age. 
the, you know, the church age, right? And they say, well, before this, there was no church. And then after the rapture is the end of the dispensation, they'll say there's no, no other church age after this. Okay, but is that, is that true? You know, when, when they think of the church age, when they think of the dispensation of, of the grace of God, they're thinking of a time period. They're thinking of a time period, right? Where there's sort of this magical people called the church of God. You know what, brethren? There's no such thing as a universal church of God. You know what the church of God is? You, right here, gathered together. This is a church, okay? Another way of saying church is congregation. Keep your finger there and go to uh, Hebrews chapter 2, please. Go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And I'm going to turn to Psalm 149. You guys go to Hebrews 2. I'm going to Psalm 149. Okay? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. Look at this. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now look at verse number 12. Saying. Now before we read what is being said, when it says here, saying, this is something that was said in the past. But let's look at it here. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, and in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. What did it say there? In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. You know where this was said? In Psalm 149, verse 1. I'll just read it to you. Psalm 149, verse 1. Praise you the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. And His praise is the, in the congregation of the saints. Actually, that's the wrong passage. Sorry, guys. Psalm 22, verse 22 is actually where it's found. Psalm 22, 22. It says, I will declare thy name. Now, you, got, you guys are in Hebrews 2, too, right? You stay in Hebrews 2, please. Look at verse number 12. Again, you guys stay in Hebrews 2. Look at verse number 12. I'm reading to you from Psalm 22, 22. Okay? Now, let's compare with what's in Psalm 22. It says, I will declare. Is that how verse 12 starts? Saying, I will declare. Let's keep going. Thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. That's what Psalm 22, 22 says. In the midst of what? The congregation. What does Hebrews chapter uh, uh, two, 11 say and 12? In the midst of the church. Okay? The Bible has defined for us what the church is. It's not some magical period of time made up of all the believers that exist out there during that time. No. The church is a congregation. What's a congregation? It's a gathering of people. It's an assembly of people. We're gathered together tonight. We are the body of Christ. We are a church right now. Okay? Because we're made up of those that Christ has redeemed. Who Christ has sanctified. Now, please go to Acts chapter 7. Go to Acts chapter 7 verse 37. Because, obviously, those that believe in dispensations or dispensationalism... They won't, they won't deny what I just said. They also believe what this is that tonight is a church. But they also believe in this sort of magical church out there as well, okay, of, of an age. But they won't, they won't disagree with this. But they believe, okay, you guys are going to Acts chapter 7. You guys are going to Acts chapter 7. They believe that the church started, okay, after Christ's resurrection. They believe, in fact, not, not, not immediately after the resurrection, usually... They, might, they probably believe it's like the day of Pentecost when the power of the Holy Ghost was given to many of the disciples and they were able to speak with many languages, preach in the gospel. Many at that point would say, well, this is when the church started. Okay? Now, I'm sure many of you were told the church started in the New Testament. Many of you were told that the church started after Christ's resurrection. Okay? But praise God, we've got His Word. And look, if you've been taught that and you believe that, I hope you're humble enough to read what we're about to read and, and change your mind. Not because Pastor Kevin says so, but change your mind because the Word of God says so. Okay? Acts chapter 7, verse 37. Acts chapter 7, verse 37. It says, This is that Moses. Is that the New Testament? No. 
With Moses, what did Moses bring in? The Old Testament, the Old Covenant with God, right? God gave Moses the Old Covenant. Moses then gave that to the children of Israel. Let's keep going. This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai. And with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Brethren, you know what? There was a church in the Old Testament. There was a church that was gathered around Mount Sinai. When God gave Moses the Old Testament, gave Moses the Old Covenant, they were in the wilderness, were they not? Christ had not yet come. Christ had not yet been born. Christ had not yet died and been resurrected. This is thousands of years before Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us this is a church in the wilderness. Praise God for His church. Brethren, listen, it's not the Jews are one people and we in the New Testament some other people. We're all a church. When we've been gathered together as a body for Jesus Christ, they are too called a church in the wilderness. Okay? Now, what's beautiful about this is if you guys go back to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. So what have I shown you so far? That the Old Testament congregation of believers were a church. What have I shown you also? That in the New Testament, when we gather together, we're a church. I mean, that destroys dispensation, <laughs> dispensationalism immediately. Because they believe, no, 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 this is the church age today. You know, there's one age for the church. And I, it, it blows my mind when we can just read the Bible clearly. And it says the total opposite. Look at the last, uh, look at verse number 21. Verse number 21 in Ephesians chapter 3. It says, unto him be glory in the church. Let's stop there a minute. You know, a church ought to give glory to God. A church ought to give glory to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's why we're here, to give glory to God. But let's keep reading. Unto him be glory in the church of Christ Jesus throughout all ages. Oh man, I thought there was just one age. Just one church age. That's when, no, throughout all ages. Doesn't that make sense? We've got a church in the Old Testament. We have churches in the New Testament. And not just that. It says throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. You know what? Church will never end. Never end. Guys, it says that world without end. You know, for all eternity, we're going to be gathered together as a congregation. Okay, once we're in heaven with God, guess where we're, what we're going to be doing? We'll be having church. Okay. Keep your finger there and go to Hebrews chapter 12. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Let me just show you this. Hebrews chapter 12, please. Hebrews chapter 12. You thought this was the end of church? Once you die, there's no more church? No, no, no. It keeps going, guys. We're going to continue having church. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. It says here, But ye... Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. I want you to see this. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. Now stop there. Now we know there's a Mount Zion in the Bible. In, in the Bible, you know, Jerusalem was called uh, Zion. And, and close to Jerusalem, there was a mount known as Mount Zion. Okay. But is this talking about an earthly Mount Zion? Let's keep going. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. Look at this. And unto the city of the living God. Say, what's God's city? Is that Jerusalem in the Middle East? Let's keep going. It says here, the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, if you guys know your Bibles, in the book of Revelation, God, after Christ's millennial reign, Christ is going to create a new heaven, isn't he? And a new earth. And what comes out of heaven? The new Jerusalem. The heavenly city. So the context of what we're seeing here in Hebrews 12, what are we talking about? We're talking about eternity. We're talking about the new heavens and the new earth. We're talking about the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly Jerusalem. Let's keep going. To an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. You know what the Bible is saying here? In, after the millennial reign of Christ, when God creates the new heavens and the new earth, 
and the new heavenly Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, we're going to have church. Okay? It says there, the church of the firstborn. You know what? It's not just going to be a church. How much, maybe there's like mid 35 of us here. I don't know. 40 of us here. It's not going to be a church of 40 people. It's going to be a church of all believers, of all the saints. Okay? From the church in the wilderness to the church in the New Testament to the church throughout all ages, world without end. You know, this world's going to end, but God creates the new heaven and the new earth, a new world to come that will never end. We're going to keep having church. I'm looking forward to hearing Jesus Christ preach a sermon. Okay, because he preached many sermons when he was here 2,000 years ago. Man, it's going to be awesome to hear it from the word of God himself. What a powerful thing. Okay, so don't be fooled that there's a church age, one church age that we're living in today. No, for all ages, all ages, even into eternity, we are going to be having church services together. All right, so brethren, brother Ramson, Michael, I mean Luke and uh, Matthew, uh, you guys are song leading. You don't know. Christ might call you up to song lead in heaven, all right? So get, get, get cracking, you know, get those voices in tune, learn the hymns, all right? Get ready for church in heaven. Praise God. All right, go back to Ephesians chapter 3, please. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, I don't want to keep debunking dispensationalism. We, just, we, we want to get what this chapter is about, okay? But I, I just, I have to do that because some will read that and just immediately go, oh man, seven years of dispens- seven dispensational periods, we're in the church age now. And, and, you know, it just confuses people, okay? Now that we know what he means, and it's not complicated, okay? Paul was given the dispensation of the grace of God. In fact, we've all been given, we've all been dispensed the grace of God to show, belie- uh, to show others the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we'll, sh- we'll look at that. Soon look at verse number 3, Ephesians 3.3. 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words... Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, he's talking about a mystery, okay? It says here in verse number 5, Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Brethren, we live in an exciting time where God has revealed to us his mystery, Okay? He's shown us through the holy apostles and prophets that it said there. But it says here, in ages past, this mystery was not made known to the sons of men. Okay? And they say, what is that mystery? It's, it's what we've been preaching about for the last few times as we've been going through the chapters here. And I'll just tell you what it is very, very quickly. It's that God would make of one people the Jews and the Gentiles. Okay? That's what we've been covering as we've been going on. But that's the mystery. Because in the Old Testament, they thought, you know, to be... God's chosen people, you have to be part of a physical nation. Well, the mystery is God's not restricted by a physical nation, that God has allowed everybody, both Gentiles and Jews, to be part of that spiritual nation. Okay? And we'll keep, I'll show you this in a moment. Um, if you can, if you can, keep your finger there and go to Luke 24. Go to Luke 24 for me. Luke 24. And as you're turning to Luke 24, I'm going to read to you from Acts chapter 10. Okay? Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, verse 42, it says, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which is ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Now it says this in verse 43. Pay attention. To him give all the prophets witness. All the prophets gave witness of Jesus Christ. Hey, but they didn't fully understand the mystery. This is the advantage we have, brethren. They didn't know the name of Christ. They didn't understand the, the full picture, you know, of Jesus Christ. But we have that. It says here, to him gave all the prophets witness that through his name... Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. You know what the Old Testament prophets taught? That through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. You know what the Old Testament taught to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. They taught that even though they did not know the name of Christ. They knew God by other names. You know, God Almighty or Jehovah. You know, they called upon other names that God had revealed to them. 
Today we have the name which by we are to be saved. That's the name of Jesus Christ. You guys are in Luke 24 verse 25. Luke 24 verse 25 says, Then he said unto them, these are the words of Jesus, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And now look at this in verse 27. And beginning at Moses, you know what Moses is? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Beginning with, from the very beginning of the Bible and all the prophets, all the writings, all the scriptures, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Brethren, all of the scriptures, all of the Old Testament is speaking of Jesus Christ. You know, even the sacrifices, they're pictures of Jesus. The priests, they're pictures of Jesus. You know, so many things. You know, the, the, the rock, by, you know, which came out the waters you know, to, 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 give, uh, to, to, give, um, to help the thirst of the Israelites. That rock is, is a picture of Jesus Christ. And so many things. I mean, I, I was teaching on, on a Sunday to my church in Queensland where Jacob is wrestling with the man. You know that man? Then he says, man, you know, I've seen God. That's Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, everything is pointing us to Jesus. But it was still a mystery to the Old Testament prophets. Though they wrote about it, so how do they write about it if they didn't know about it? Because it's the words of God. Okay, they were moved by the Holy Ghost to write these things. All right? And the last uh, portion, you guys go back to Ephesians 3. The last portion that I'll read to you is John chapter 5, verse 46. And Jesus says this to the Jews that don't believe on him. He says to them, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Who wrote of Jesus? Moses wrote of Jesus. But if you believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Another thing, just just quick one, guys. Judaism is a false religion. Judaism, okay? The religion of the Jews is a false religion. It's not that they're following Moses. They believe what Moses wrote. It's not. Because Jesus says, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. Do the Jews believe in Jesus? No. You know why? Because they don't even believe Moses. They don't even believe the Old Testament scriptures. Okay? It's, it's not Old Testament Christianity. What they believe today is a false religion. And it is not what the true uh, 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 faith of the Old Testament saints were. The true faith of the Old Testament saints was placed still on Jesus Christ. Though the full mystery was not yet revealed unto them. Okay? Back to Ephesians chapter 3 verse 6. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 6. This is the mystery, brethren, and I already, I already spoiled it for you, but you know, I wanted to uh, build upon this. Verse number 6. This is the mystery that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel. The gospel. Brethren, you know what the gospel is? Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Salvation by grace through faith without works. That's the gospel message, right? And then verse number 7 says this, Whereof I was made a minister. Oh man, Paul, did you go to Bible college and get your qualifications? Is that the ministry that you got into? You know, have you been, have you been lifted up? No, when it says here, Whereof I was made a minister, he's saying I'm a minister of the gospel. He's a preacher of the gospel. And this is according to the gift, there it is, that's the dispensation of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. You know what makes you an effective soul winner, guys? When you can tap into the power of God. God has given you His power, He's given you His gospel, so we can get out there and open our mouths boldly and preach the gospel. Okay? Verse number 8. Unto me, now I love His humility here, but notice what He says, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Keep your finger there and go to 1 Corinthians, please. Go to 1 Corinthians. Keep your finger there. What does Paul say about himself? He goes, I'm the least, right? I'm the least of all the saints. And brethren, I don't know how you feel about yourselves, okay? I don't know if you feel, I'm just, you know, I'm too old to preach the gospel. I'm too old for God to use me. I'm too young for God to use me. I'm too sick for God to use me. I've only been saved for a month. How can God use me? 
You know, I, I, I'm not like these other saints. I'm not like these other believers. I don't know. Is that your attitude? Well, Paul says, I was the least. And you know what? God still uses the least. Okay? It doesn't matter how weak you are. It doesn't matter what your failings are. It doesn't matter what your struggles are. God has given us all the ministry of reconciliation. God has given us all the ability and the power to preach his gospel to this community. You guys are in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse, verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26. Brethren, I, I don't know what you think of me. I don't know if you think, man, that Pastor Kevin, he's all right. You know, he can preach pretty powerfully the word of God. Uh, brethren, I'm the least, okay? I'm just a normal human being with the same doubts, the same fears, okay? When I come up here to preach, I have butterflies in my stomach. I'm nervous. You know, I'm praying to God, can you use me? I think I'm going to forget everything I prepared. You know, I have nightmares where I get behind the pulpit and I've, I don't even know what I'm preaching today. Right? <laughs> but who does God use? Look at 1 Corinthians 1.26. For ye see your calling, brethren. Brethren, are you a brother in the Lord? Are you a sister in the Lord? This is for you, brethren. How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God have chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God have chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things. You know what base means? The basic things, the simple things of the world, the things which are despised. God, sorry, have God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You know who God uses the most to do His work? The weak. Okay, the weak. The humble. The least. The simple. Okay? You need to, if, if you think you're, oh man, look at me, I'm so good. I've been saved for so long. Look how good I, God's not going to use you if you have that attitude. Okay? You've got to have the attitude of Paul. He had power, but he was also very humble. He realizes, man, if not for God, I'd be weak in this world. If not for God, I'd just be a foolish person. You know, and I'm telling you, brethren, I don't, I, don't, I don't care how weak you think you are, how old or how young or how immature or carnal. If you're a believer in Christ, God can give you the power to do his mighty works. OK, I'm going to read Well, you guys, you guys in first Corinthians. So go to second Corinthians. Next book over second Corinthians, chapter five, second Corinthians, chapter five, please. Verse 18, second Corinthians, chapter five, verse 18. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. It says, And all things are of God, who have reconciled us, who's us? All of us. He's reconciled us, right? To himself by Jesus Christ and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. It's not just Paul that was given this dispensation of the, you know, of the grace of God. It's not just him that was made a minister. To us, he's given us the ministry of of reconciliation if you've been reconciled to god through salvation guess what now you're a minister you're here to serve god by reconciling other people to god you know what you need to do you go and preach them the gospel anytime you have the opportunity you know maybe you have a time with the church you haven't done it before go as a silent partner go with someone that has preached the gospel someone that's gaining experience go with them and learn brethren and, uh, and let's keep going. Verse number 19. To wit that God was in Christ. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 19. To wit that God was in Christ. You know what to wit means? To witness. You know when you go and you preach the gospel, you're witnessing to others what God has done for us in Christ. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciled the, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation. Do we have any gospel tracks here? Yeah? At the top? All right. Some churches do this. Oh man, I've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Where's the closest letterbox? Oh, I've done my job. Praise God. <laughs> I've delivered the piece of paper into the letterbox. Oh man, what a great minister of God. 
<laughs> well, what did it say there in verse number 19? And have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You've got to open your mouth and tell people about Jesus Christ. This is, this is not what God's called you to do. Letterbox, all right? Now, I'm not saying there's never a time for that. I don't mind. I don't mind sending the kids out there doing a mass letterbox round and inviting people to our church. But that should never, ever replace gospel preaching. Door-to-door gospel preaching. Now, brethren, I don't like, I don't know, maybe you don't like it when I preach about the gospel, preaching the gospel. I, I don't know how I could preach the Bible to you without ever talking about the gospel, like preaching the gospel. You know, I've been in churches that have encouraged you to go soul winning. And when I've not gone soul winning, I've been feeling really guilty. I'm like, oh man, I need to get out there, I need to get out there, right? But then I've been in other churches where they never talk about going out and preaching the gospel. And then you feel pretty good about yourself. Because you never feel you know, convicted that you're, you're not doing it. Like, you feel, oh no, well, this church doesn't require me. Now look, it's not like I come here and I'm trying to, it's not like I'm trying to put pressure. I don't come in on Tuesday night thinking, you know what, I'm going to really put a lot of pressure on people to go soul winning today. I'm just, I'm preaching through Ephesians 3, right? I, I don't know how pastors open this book and, 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 and fail to mention the need to preach the gospel to people. I don't understand that. It's on every page, it's in every chapter, it's in every book of the Bible, the need to get out there and preach the gospel. And if you don't preach the gospel and this message makes you uncomfortable, good, good. It's not me making you uncomfortable, it's the word of God making you uncomfortable, okay? And if you don't come to be challenged, then why do you come to church? Do you come to church just to be told, oh, you're doing well, brother, you're doing well, sister. Just stay as you are. You don't need to keep growing. No, you come to church because you need to be challenged to, to work hard, to grow, to mature, all right? to, be, to be a blessing to others, to, to see souls saved, to have your eyes set on eternity and not just on the temporal things of this world. Back to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 and uh, verse number 9. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9. It says here, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of this mystery, which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, another thing that I need to just mention about dispensationalism. Dispensation, remember how I told you that God has, you know, they teach that God has set up a dispensation and then men fail, so God has created a new dispensation. Well, they teach that basically when Jesus Christ came to this earth, that he came basically to be the king of the Jews. He came to set up his kingdom right there and then. But because Israel rejected their Messiah, because Israel rejected God, well, they failed. And so God then had to open up a new dispensation. And the idea behind that, I mean, think about that. And so instead of Christ being the king of Israel at that point in time, then we'll, well, what else is Christ going to do? Oh, let's die on the cross for the Gentiles now. Since the Jews have rejected me, now I'm going, to, I'm going to die on the cross for the Gentiles. How does that make you feel, though? If that's true, that Jesus came for, just for the Jews to be their king, but since, thank, thank God they rejected Christ. Thank God they crucified him, because now I get in. You know what this, basically, that teaching just says, your plan B. You know, plan A failed, right? They failed, so God opened up a new dispensation, and now you're plan B, and you get in on plan B. No, brethren, you are plan A. Christ came to die on the cross. No matter what was going on, that was his ministry. That was the work that God gave him to do. Even before he started his ministry, what's the first thing he does? He gets baptized. Picturing his death, burial, and resurrection. He knew when he started his ministry, he went to John the Baptist and go, well, right from the beginning, I know I'm going to die on the cross. So he gets baptized as a picture of his, the end of his ministry. You know, the climax of his ministry. And I say that because look at verse number 9 again. It's not plan B. It says, and to make all men see what is this fellowship of the mystery. Look at this. Which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God. It's not like, well, we've got to come up with a new plan now. It was a plan from the beginning. It was just hidden. In the Old Testament days, it was just hidden. But when something's hidden, it means it exists. All right? If, I, if, if I'm going to hide these keys, I'm going to hide them back here. Does it mean that the keys don't exist until I pull them out? Now, oh, plan B. Now, oh, when I hit them, they existed. It, it was, it just, you couldn't see them. But now, no more hidden. It's been fully revealed, right? Fully revealed. 
And uh, this is important because, uh, I'll, I'll just start, I'll, I'll speed up here. I'm going to read to you from Matthew 13, verse 16. Matthew 13, verse 16. Jesus says this, these words, But blessed are your ears, you, sorry, blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Now look what he says here. Jesus, just pay attention to the words of Christ. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have this desire to see those things which you see. The Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament saints, they desired to see what we see, see, to hear what we hear. They knew about a hidden mystery. They knew it existed, but they didn't fully understand it. It says here, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. So they knew about the mystery. It just wasn't fully revealed. You know, this kind of reminds me of the book of Daniel. If you remember the book of Daniel, I've got the reference here. After Daniel writes the whole book, you know, and part of it's half of the book of Daniel is about present time, and the other half of the book of Daniel is about future events. And then uh, Daniel asks this question towards God after he's finished writing it. He says, and I heard, Daniel says these words, and I heard, but I understood not. So Daniel just finished writing this book. He goes, I don't understand it. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, this is what God says to Daniel, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Okay? So Daniel, he writes this book and he doesn't fully understand it, right? And God says, well, it's not for you to understand. It's for the, it's for the end. And thank God we've been given the book of Revelation. Revelation is to reveal. Now we know what the end times are about. Now with the, with the understanding of the book of Revelation and the other epistles about the end times, we can go back to the book of Daniel and see how that ties in with the end of the world. But Daniel did not have that. He knew, he knew, he, he desired to see what we see, but he couldn't understand, you know, it was hid from him. You know, the book was closed up and he wrote his own book and he didn't fully understand what he was writing. Again, because it was, it's from God. You know, the Holy Spirit is the one that writes the Bible, not men. Back in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. It says here, To the intent that now unto the principles and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifest wisdom of God. <clears throat> now that verse 10 is a little bit tough to, to break down. But let me explain to you very quickly. When it says here the principalities and powers in heavenly places, you know it's talking about? It's talking about the, the heavenly host. You know, the angels, the seraphims, the, all the kind of creatures that are in heaven that make up their heavenly hosts. And this is what's interesting about the local church, okay, the body of Christ. It says here, I'll read it slowly. To the intent and now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church. So the heavenly hosts have uh, been made known. They've been made aware of something by the church. What are they, what's been made known? The manifold wisdom of God. Brethren, I don't think you understand the importance of church. Okay? When the heavenly host looked down at New Life Baptist Church here in, in Fairfield and other churches that belong to God, okay, they see the manifold wisdom of God. I say, wow, was, this was God's plan all along? For Jesus Christ to go and die on the cross and to gather believers together, Jews and Gentiles into one body, when the heavenly hosts look at us gathered together from all places, all different backgrounds, all kinds of nationalities, they see the wisdom, the manifold wisdom of God. You know, they're surprised by the wisdom of God, by us just gathering together. You know, when we gather together, man, the angels of heaven are watching. Look at the wisdom of God go there, right? Uh, so church is very, very important. Verse number 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> now, next words, verse 12. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Brethren, let me read that again. In whom, in Jesus, we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. You know, Paul's going for tribulation. He's a prisoner. He goes, I don't want you to faint. I don't want you to give up. I want you to have boldness. I want you to have confidence in the faith. Paul said, man, I have confidence in Christ. I have my faith in Christ. Brethren, please strive, ask God, pray for boldness, pray for confidence. You know who should be the most bold people in this world? 
the most confident people in this world should be you. Because you're in Christ Jesus. Brethren, when you go and knock those doors, when you go and preach the gospel, don't be like, I, yeah, I'm, I'm here to preach the gospel. No, you go there, bang, bang, bang. Hey, I've got the best news for you. All right, do you want to know how you can be 100% sure you're going to heaven? Guess what? I'm 100% sure I'm going to heaven, praise God. Not because I'm good enough. In fact, I'm a failure. I know I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. You give me a few minutes, I'll show you right now how you can be sure of going to heaven. And you've got to have confidence. You've got to have boldness in Jesus Christ. I don't know about, you know, I've had times when I've gone soul winning and people have tried to get, make, like, make you afraid. Okay, they, they swear at you. They might say, hey, I, I don't go to your house knocking your doors. You know, can you stop coming to my house? Can you stop bothering my neighbors? You know what my response is? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to bother you. Oh, I'll keep going. And I say, no, I'm going to keep coming. They say, oh, I'll call the police. Call the police. I've had people ring me and say, hey, your church is littering. They've littered on my, on my front door. I said, well, no, we just left a leaflet on your door. Oh, man, you know, littering is a crime. I'm going to call the police. Then why are you calling me? If someone's, if someone's committed a crime to me, I'm not going to call the criminal. I'm going to call the police. Why, if, if, I, I, honestly, people say I'm going to call, call the police. I always say, I, I, look, especially by email or stuff, stuff like that, I'm like, well, either call the police or call me. Call someone. Talk to someone. All right? I hope they call me so I can give them the gospel over the phone. Okay? I mean, look, we live in a, in, a, in a generation, brethren, and it's because of television. When they show pastors, you know, they show these pastors that usually are unmarried, no children, you know, timid men, you know, af afraid to stand up, you know, using their weak little voices. You know, God loves you. They preach sermons like this. Oh, man, live your best life now. No, brethren, that's not how we ought to be. That's not how you need to be. I'm sorry TV has fooled you. I'm sorry that those churches you've been at where you think Christians are these, these timid little creatures going around that, you know, no, no, that's not Christianity, brethren. That's not Christianity. Christianity is in the face of going to prison, in the face of being a prisoner for Jesus Christ, you still have confidence, you still have boldness in the faith of, because of Jesus Christ. Don't let anyone scare you when you give the gospel. These are the words of life. Don't let anyone scare you away, brethren. And if you get attacked, give glory to God. Because great are your riches in heaven. Great are your... Now look, I've never been physically attacked. I've upset a lot of people, but I've never been physically attacked. The worst I've gotten is a dog nipping at my heels. Didn't get past... I didn't get far, okay? But that's the worst I've had. Now we live in a country where you pretty much are... F you're free. It, it, it is your legal right to go to someone's door and tell them about the gospel, okay? Don't be afraid, okay? You, number one, you have the law on your side, but who cares if the law's not even on your side? You have Jesus Christ on your side, and he's given you the ministry of reconciliation. Verse number 14, verse number 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom, now I love these words, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The whole family. You know, brethren, this is your family here in the church. These are our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We also have other family of other believers that are out there meeting in churches. You know, even other brethren that don't attend church, that's our family. The saints that have gone before us, that's our family. Moses, Abraham, Jacob, King David, Solomon, Gideon, Samson, Paul, Peter, James and John. These are all our family. Okay? All our family, Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, we're all made one. Now notice again there, I'll just read it again. Verse number 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. In, in, how are we named? Look at verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of whom? Of whom? Jesus Christ, that is whom? The whole family in heaven and earth is named. Once again, the Old Testament saints were saved because of Jesus Christ. That's what makes them the family. Okay? Again, mystery. They didn't know it all. It wasn't fully revealed. But they were saved the same way. Faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what makes them family. 
Verse number 16. That he would grant you, that's Jesus, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. There it is. I told you we need the confidence, we need the, the boldness. And if you're saying I'm lacking confidence, I'm lacking boldness, well, this is what you need. You need to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit, okay, in the inner man. What's the inner man? That's the same way of saying the new man, the new creature, the spirit, okay? Not the flesh, not the old man, not the carnal mind. You need to be strengthened in the inner man by the Holy Spirit, okay? Don't find strength in your own, in your own abilities. Look for strength through the Holy Spirit, okay? To have that confidence and the boldness you need to serve Christ. Verse number 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend. You know the word comprehend is to understand, right? That you may be able to comprehend or understand with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Brethren, the love of Christ. Okay, the love of Christ here. It talks about how... Look, it talks about its breadth, its length, its depth and height. I've often heard this said, you know, that we live in a three-dimensional world, okay? You know, we see things in three dimensions, don't we? Length, breadth and height. But when you look at the love of Christ, there's a fourth dimension. It's, four, it's outside of our dimension, okay? It's breadth, length, depth and height. And I, I don't fully understand that because it's outside of our dimension. And that's why it says here... It says in verse number 19, And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. Now, you might misread this. What this is saying is, it's outside of our knowledge. Okay? It passes our knowledge. Like, we can't fully know it. It, it passes it. Okay? It's not saying the love of Christ passes, like gives us knowledge. I guess it gives us knowledge as well. But it's saying that it, it's, it's so infinite, it's so wide, that our knowledge can't fully understand it. Like, it just passes by, as it were. That's, that's what it means there that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And I think when it says here, being filled with the fullness of God, this is where the fourth dimension comes in. Like we see things in, in three dimensions, but this can't pass through me, right? But the love of God can pass through me. The love of God, the love of Christ can pass through us. We can be filled with the love of God. And I think that's where the fourth dimension is. Something that a three-dimensional object cannot do, okay, cannot go through objects, but the love of Christ can go through all of us. So it's a great thing can reside inside of us and uh, it says in verse number 20 now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us look at that unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end amen just to summarize verse 20 because I've already covered verse 21 but verse 20 once again let's end on that it says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. God can do more than you could possibly think for you. You could serve God in a greater capacity than you could possibly think. You might say right now, God, I could never go to like a third world country and serve you on a missionary field. Maybe you're saying, God, I could never be a pastor. Lord, I can never know what the Bible teaches. So much. You know, God can do abundantly. More than you could possibly think or even ask for. You just need to tap into the power of God. Tap into the power of God. Tap into the love of Jesus Christ. You know, the inner man, the new man. That's where you need to be walking by. Not this flesh. You know, don't, don't you know, we all fa we're all sinners. Meaning we're, we all walk according to the lust of this flesh from time to time. But if you really want the power of God in your life, you need to minimize that as much as you possibly can. You need to be walking in that new man. You need to be seeking the Spirit of God in your life. You know, instead of filling your minds with the, this world's entertainment, you know, fill your minds with the Bible. Fill your minds with good preaching. Fill your minds with church attendance. Fill your hearts and your minds with prayer as you go to the Lord. Fill your minds with the heart of, uh, sorry, with the love of Jesus Christ. You know, meditate on what Christ has done for you. Think about the ministry of reconciliation that God has given you. Brethren, how much are you fulfilling that ministry that God has given you? If you say, well, I've never once given the gospel, ever. Well, brethren, you're failing. You're failing. You know, you need to give the gospel to somebody. If it's your family, if it's your friends, your children, it's whatever, a loved one. 
Get time. Ask, ask God. Oh, God, give me a time. Give me an opportunity. And when God gives it to you, you take it. You know, when I was afra- at, at the beginning, when I was afraid to go soul winning, I would say to God, well, God, can you just give me time, like alone time with one person to give them the gospel? This is early on. And God will answer that prayer. God will give me time alone with somebody. And then I'd freeze. And I wouldn't give them the gospel. That's failing. It's failing. Okay? Maybe you failed. I've known I failed. But then do we, do we just stay there? Do we just stay there in, in, in the position of failure? Or do we just mourn about it? Do we just get sad about it? Lord, I failed you. Please forgive me. You, you answered my prayer and I didn't do my part of the bargain. I'm sorry, God. Next time, I'll do it. Next time. Next time you might fail again. Say, well, Lord, I failed again. Help me get up one more time. Help me g- give the gospel to somebody. You know, the easiest thing to do, brethren, if, you, if you've never done it, just go out as a silent partner. Just on Sunday when you guys go out, just say, look, I'd like to go just quietly, silently. I don't want to open my mouth. Hey, there'll be somebody that can take your soul with you. Okay? Uh, you know, ask Christ to help you. Ask Christ for his confidence and his boldness in your life. Let's pray.